Just before we get into the main episode, a quick message from a friend of On Farm recorded in her tractor cab. Hello, my name is Katie Brisbane and I am a project coordinator for RET, the Royal Highland Education Trust. We work to give children a greater understanding of food, farming and the countryside. This year we have a focus on the journey of food, seeds and grains, highlighting all the great things produced by Scotland soils. If you're a farmer or work in a rural business and you'd like to get involved to volunteer or sponsor our work, we'd love to hear from you. We also have a huge range of educational resources on the website. If you know any teachers or educators who might appreciate them, you can find out more at www.red.org.uk. So how important is diversity in agriculture and how is it being supported? So is there a way we can rebrand and redefine what a new entrant actually is? I'd just like to ask the Cabinet Secretary to start with how young people in agriculture can get involved in policy consultation and why it's important for people of our age group to do that. That should be coming straight onto our desk at the committee meeting. Any chat that's going on about agriculture within Scotland, we're the future of it, so it should be landing on our desk. Welcome to On Farm. I'm Anna Davis and as always it's great to be here. But I am very much taking a back seat this week uh, because we have gathered together four senior figures from the Scottish Association of Young Farmers Clubs and uh, very evidently I am far too old uh, to pay, play a big part in that kind of an episode. So they'll be taking centre stage, but they are here to have um, a Q&A with Scottish Government Cabinet Secretary Mary Goujon. As you're here, it's a whistle-stop tour around a whole range of important issues, how the future uh, of Scottish farming is going to pan out, how young farmers can get involved in shaping future policy, rural mental health, housing quality and much more besides. So a very busy episode with lots of voices and lots of points of view to be heard. I think best to kick things off by letting our four young farmers introduce themselves and then we can get straight into the chat. My name is Ben McClymont, SEYFC member, Agri Affairs Committee member and also Bothings and Borders Next Generation Committee member for NFUS. I live in a village of Path Heads just outside Edinburgh and I'm Assistant Farm Manager at Preston Hall Farms and Farm Manager at Sockland Farm, um, a beef and sheep farm just in Midlothian. Hello, so I'm Amy Jo Reid. I'm this year's SEYFC Agri and Rural Affairs Vice Chair for the area. I'm a self-employed shepherd living up in Speyside in Murray. Um, so I run an organic contract flock and run my own flock on seasonal lets. Um, I've been involved with the SAYFC for a number of years now and through that I've managed to go to the Oxford Farming Conference as a scholar and get involved with the Morden Institute as a North of Scotland regional advisor and also with the National Sheep Association. My name is John McCulloch. I am the West Region Chairman for agri Rural Affairs for Young Farmers. I'm also chairman of Stuart Ray Young Farmers and I am a, a member of the NFUS Next Generation Group. Um, I'm a stockman at G Barbary Co, um, a beef farm in Dumfries and Galloway and I live in the village of Crockett Ford, just outside Dumfries. I'm Gillian Kennedy, SEYFC member and I'm a committee member on the Agri and Rural Affairs Committee. I'm from a hill sheep and cattle farm near Aberfeldy and I currently work as a forest manager with Scottish Woodlands. This is all about a two-way chat today but I'd love Cabinet Secretary if you could maybe kick us off and just kind of tell us what it is you would like the young farmers to hear from you before we they then start perhaps probing you with some questions so yeah just just tell us what you'd like them to hear from your side if that's okay. Yeah no problem at all I mean I do think that if this moment that we're in right now, we're in this period of transformation and a, a real period of uncertainty as well. I mean, I think when you look at the situation and just the horrendous events that are unfolding in the Ukraine too, I think it throws our whole food production and it's put that right into the limelight and made us focus more than ever on our food security and how important our food production and food security is going forward. But I think as much as we've got a lot of these challenges that we need to try and get over, I think it's also quite an exciting time as well. I mean, I feel a, a huge responsibility in terms of of my role and setting the, the future policy and direction for agriculture going forward. But I think 
it's like anything, you know, when we talk about challenges, there's always opportunities with that as well. And I think that as much as it can seem quite an uncertain time, I think it can also be seen as quite quite an exciting one too, where there will be a lot of opportunities for people. And I really want to see our, our the sector flourish. And I want to see more young people come and get involved in, in land-based careers and uh, in farming and food production too and crofting as well as that. So I do think that there's a lot of potential there. It is an exciting time too. And yeah, I suppose that's how I'd probably like to kick things off. And I suppose I'm just looking forward to, to hearing from you as well. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. As I said before, we're not going to hear very much of my voice. So I think initially I'm going to hand over to John, if that's okay, who I think has a question and then we could just use that as the start of our chat. Thanks very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd just like to ask the Cabinet Secretary to start with um, how young people in agriculture can get involved in, in policy consultation and why it's important for people of our age group to do that and also what consultations are coming up that will be key to the future of the agricultural industry in Scotland and what are the benefits of getting involved? Well, first of all, I would say it's really important and really vital that as many people as possible get involved and take part in it because obviously you as farmers are going to be impacted by the future payment regime and that's why it's absolutely crucial for me that we get your views as part of that that process and through the consultations that will be coming because you know, you have an absolutely valuable role to play in the journey that we're taking from now until the the, the new policy comes in place in 2025. So there will be a lot happening over the course of, of the next few months. We've already committed to introducing a new bill, a new agriculture bill to the Scottish Parliament next year, which means that we'll be starting the consultation on that this year too. It's really important that everybody has their say. And I really want to try and make sure that we make that consultation as open and transparent as possible and really easy for people to access. And I'm also open to ideas from you. Like if you think there's ways that, I, I don't know how you find consultation processes that we tend to run in government so far, you know, whether they think that, you know, do we do a good job of engaging with young farmers? And is there more that we can do to say directly work with you in terms of spreading the word of the consultations that we're going to launch? and getting out the word about, you know, why these are so important and why people should take part because, you know, you're all affected by the payment system. You'll know that system inside out and that's where it's critical that we get your voice as we look to change that into the future as well. So I'm more than happy to take your ideas away and see how you can do that and really, like I, you know, it's like I was saying, just making that process as, as open and transparent as possible. Apologies there, I, I missed that. And that's a point that I'm just going to highlight now is rural broadband in Scotland. I just dropped out. We're expected to do everything online nowadays. And I'm only half an hour from Edinburgh <laughs> and have no internet. Um, and it's something that we, in Scotland, we should be getting rolled out across the country. You're absolutely right. And on that point, I would say that that is something that that's why the Scottish government has made extra investment to try and do exactly that. And I think because especially with everything that's happened over the course of the past couple of years, I think it can be a real opportunity for people to to enable more people to live and work from where they live and to do that in remote and rural areas. But you're absolutely right. I mean, to enable that to happen, we need connectivity, whether that's transport connectivity, whether that's broadband as well. But I mean, that's why we have put extra funding into that and to try and roll that out as, as fast as possible. Cabinet Secretary, I was just kind of wanting to slightly delve a little bit more actually into the, the, your answer to uh, John's question before. How, in your experience, um, how much involvement have you seen from, from younger farmers in terms of policy making? And, and do you think there are any key barriers? I mean, I, I'd like for us to talk about, you know, health and well-being later on. But do you think perhaps it's a confidence thing? Does the industry need to enable more younger people to have the confidence to engage with people like yourself and with policy making? What do you think might be some of the barriers that, that collectively, but with your help and within the industry, we can kind of work on? Yeah, well, I suppose in terms of the barriers, again, that's probably where I'd like to hear from you guys as to what you think some of the barriers are, what might prevent you or other young farmers that you know from from taking part? Because I mean, certainly for me, I, I would like to think that I'm open and accessible and I certainly try to be. And to be honest, if anybody wants to invite me out on farm, I'm more than happy to do it. I like to get out and about. And for me, that's the most important part of my job anyway, because it's important for me for me to to undertake that learning and to really understand how things are for you. So I'm more than happy to try and do that. But I think that sometimes 
like things in government are always moving. There's always a lot going on. And I know that we can have consultation after consultation after consultation. And you've all got businesses to run. So I, I recognise that it's sometimes it may not be top of your priority list or in terms of the communications we're putting out about it, they may not be reaching you in the way that they should. But um, yeah, I think that's where I'd be keen to hear what the barriers are, because I want to make sure that when we go out to consultation, we're getting a proper representative view of how people feel about things, really getting people's thoughts and ideas. But of course, if we'd only reach in a certain, um, a certain area or a specific part of uh, of the industry, then, you know, that's a problem. And we want to make sure it's as open and representative as possible. So again, if anybody has any, any particular ideas about how we can better do that on the call and just now, or even to follow up with me after, I'm really happy to consider that because I think we have some examples where we've undertaken consultation in government that's been really good. Um, we also had, we had a consultation towards the end of last year. I, well, I suppose I'd actually be interested to find out if any of you took part in that because I know that NFUS had had their own consultation events trying to, uh, around the country trying to reach as many people as possible. And that was once we'd considered all the farmer-led group reports on future policy and the direction that should take. And there was a big consultation event after that. So, uh, yeah, I suppose I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that and if you took part and what more we can do to try and enable that to happen. So the floor's open, guys. Before we move on to the next question, if you've got anything to say on that, uh, now is your opportunity. I think um, getting to the right people, all four of us sit on the Agri Affairs Committee for SAYFC. That should be coming straight onto our desk at the committee meeting. Any consultation, any chat that, that's going on about agriculture within Scotland. We're the future of it, I like to think. Um, so it should be landing on our desk. Um, and then we can put it to members of our organisation. And also, a number of us are also on NFUS Next Gen as well, which again is the next generation of NFUS. So, uh, yeah, they're two groups that we should be pinging everything to um, with like-minded people that actually yeah, really care about the future of our industry. Brilliant. Oh, no, well, I'll certainly make sure that we're doing that as well. And if you would find it helpful even to have, I think what I'd be happy to do as well, even fairly regular catch-ups that I can have with you, whether that's with the Agri Affairs Committee as well. So you can have that those kind of discussions or put, those, uh, put questions to me. But of course, we wouldn't want you to wait for that happening anyway. And please feel free to contact me at any time if there are any particular issues you want to discuss. But I think those are definitely points that we can take away from today and make sure that we're engaging you with that. Great. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, Gillian, I think uh, you have a question next. I do, um, Cabinet Secretary. I think this is linked quite well to the way the conversation went with um, John's question there but diversity and getting a diverse range of voices is is obviously really really important especially you touched on uncertainty and the challenges coming up surrounding food security and obviously we're approaching a number of consultations as well so how important is diversity in agriculture and how is it being supported so that you can hear different voices coming in on these consultations mm -hmm. The, that diversity is really important. And again, that's where I want to try and make sure as far as I possibly can that we are hearing from that diverse range of voices as we're approaching these consultations as well. Because in agriculture, we need people with diverse skills to enable the industry to adapt to the challenges that are going to be facing us now and that are going to be coming further down the line as well. And I think it's, you know, it's people all gender identity are going to be an essential part of the future of Scottish agriculture. So developing and expanding the skills and talents really will help ensure the long-term sustainability of the industry as a whole so again that's why it's really important that we that we hear from everyone as we are shaping that that future as well i mean we have undertaken some initiatives so far to try and encourage that diversity so we made a commitment in our manifesto to double the amount of support to uh, 600,000 pounds a year over the course of the parliament to really try and deliver practical solutions to improve the lives of women living and working in agriculture and really try and help them build more resilient businesses too. And we've also rolled out a, a personal development training programme for women called Be Your Best Self. And that's for women of all ages who are living and working in Scottish agriculture. Um, and I think I'm aware that um, some of the SAYFC members have done that training as well. And we're going to be piloting uh, agricultural business skills training in the coming year too. And of course, I'd be really keen for, for you to engage in this opportunity as well. 
And uh, in terms of some of the other things that we've done, we've also established the Women in Agriculture and Women in Rural Practical Training Funds. That's for young women aged 13 and over. And I know that some are already accessing that fund to help them grow their skills and businesses. And we've actually established a fund which is open to everyone over the age of, of 13 to try and whether that's a learning various different skills and there's different training programmes available. So we really are trying to do what we can to make sure that we are building that that diversity. And we also just want to encourage that that confidence so that people feel confident enough to, to come forward and take part in, in all the sort that we're undertaking too. So uh, I think that we have started to see a bit of a positive impact on that, but that's why we've committed to, to keeping that funding and investing in that because we think that's really important going forward. I think it's mindful um, at that point to discuss the, the women in agriculture movement is fantastic, but there's two young men sitting here. There's not the same training being provided for you guys to coming out um, in the industry and trying to make a name for themselves. It's fantastic. We should be supporting women in agriculture because the, the divide is um, biased at the minute, but we can't forget that there's also a lot of young guys that are looking for the same opportunities and it's not there. Oh, you're absolutely right. But I mean, that's why I said the, the fund that I just mentioned there as well is open to everyone over the age of 13 to enable everyone to access, whether that's trying to, oh, there's a whole wide variety of different uh, skills and training programmes that are available to to improve, reskill or look at something entirely different because we want to give that same opportunity to everyone. But we've also got to recognise that we do need to better ensure that women are better represented. And again, it's about building that confidence and seeing that diversity. So that's why there's that extra investment there. But in terms of the reskilling and training opportunities, we want to make sure that's available to everyone. That leads really well on to my next comment. Um, as somebody that's tr currently trying to um, employ people, we've just taken on a new apprentice on farm, which is fantastic. And it, uh, that's something we should be rolling out more and more across the industry, employing apprentices. But the biggest barrier I have at the minute is actually training people and I don't want to sound negative at all, but there's just not people there to provide training. And we're desperately trying to get young people moving up the ladder so they can take on more, but there's not the providers for training. Right. No, well, what you've said in relation to apprentices, it's, well, it's really positive to hear that you're doing that. And again, that is something that we definitely want to encourage as well. I know Ringlink and some of the machinery rings have been a, a massive driver behind trying to, to, to promote that. But I do absolutely accept the point that you've said that about training. It's the availability of that and how we can how we can better provide that. I mean, one thing that we have done is we've paid for the development and I, I hope you would have heard of it, but if you haven't, it's a programme called Skill Seeder. So that's a skill sharing app really aimed at encouraging greater participation in rural and land-based training. And that's some of the some of the programmes I talked about earlier are mainly run through this. And that has over 5,000 courses uploaded just as I was mentioning previously as well, it's for uh, people over the age of 13 and trying to find the right training for their needs. So we've already used that app. Again, if you haven't had a chance to look at the app or website, uh, definitely do that. And hopefully it, it will be able to help you in relation to some of that, that training that you might be looking for in relation to your apprentices as well. As some of the other programmes that we have in government too, we've just recently announced the opening of the next round of Knowledge Transfer and Innovation Fund. Now, I suppose that's not so much for the, the training and the training for apprentices, uh, what you've talked about there, but that's really providing a fund for projects that are aiming to introduce new and innovative approaches in agricultural practice or really trying to improve sector knowledge and transfer and skills. So I think that that offers some really exciting opportunities there too. But again, if there's more that we need to be doing in relation to that training element, then of course we we want to look at that because we need to make sure that we're that we're given that you have the the ability to do that if you're taking on apprentices and, and to give them the best experience as possible. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I um have been involved in the facilitation of the Be Your Best Self program, and I do take Ben's point. Um, that yes, it, it's as an example, it's only um, applicable to women. But so far, we've seen 60 people go through and it's just been really heartwarming to see the levels of confidence and, and skills increasing as these people go through. So um, the more training out there, the better, as far as I'm concerned. I'd like to come to Amy Jo next, if that's OK. Um, Amy Jo, I know that you've got, uh, I think, more than one question, actually, but uh, kick off with your favourite one, if you don't mind. <laughs> Thank you very much. It sort of follows on nicely to attract new people and young people into the agriculture. And I just want to know how the government are 
proposing to attract and support new people coming into our industry, not just young people starting out in agriculture or in land-based sectors, but maybe attracting people from other sectors and other industries so that we're getting a wider, diverse range of skills as well into agriculture. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that's really important. Well, in terms of younger people, but like you say, people that have other experience as well, you know, that would be looking to get into the industry too. But, you know, part of the key for me is trying to identify, well, what are the barriers that are in place and what is it that, that put people off either in, in an agriculture or, or not considering that as a career or, a, or an opportunity that they think they might have. And we know that there are a number of obstacles there which can be really off-putting for people. And we know, for example, that what can be one of the biggest barriers for people is access to land, the land values, land prices in relation to that. Um, but I think that we, yeah, we want to ensure that we have as, as diverse a range of opportunities for people as possible and we're encouraging people uh, to get involved. We we committed to in our manifesto to look at what support we could provide for new entrants to hopefully try and overcome some of these barriers. And we'd actually undertaken an evaluation of the previous schemes that we'd had. So we'd had a number of different schemes in the past that had either provided capital funding or different types of support. And the evaluation of, the, of that was just published, I think that was last week or the week before. So we're looking at the outcome of that to help us develop, uh, you know, a programme for, for new entrants going forward to ensure that we get that right and we're offering that support uh, where, it's, where it's best needed and where it's going to have the, the biggest impact as well to try and encourage new people into the industry. Because it's like I was saying at the start there, I mean, there are so many challenges at the moment, but I do think that, you know, we should be talking about this as a, an exciting sector and exciting industry going forward because that's certainly the way that I feel about it and I look really positively on the future as well so um, yeah we want to make sure that, that we get people in and get people interested. The new entrant thing is something that's definitely close to my heart because I could know at least a dozen people off the top of my head that and including myself unfortunately didn't make the grades for the new entrant grant at all. According to the government, we're not farming because we don't have any land security. And 18 months of running your own business just isn't enough. With cattle, you don't have time to get any return and you're lucky with sheep if you've got one year's worth of return. So is there a way we can rebrand and redefine what a new entrant actually is? Because a lot of us start out on seasonal lets or winter grazings. And as I say, we don't have any security. We can't get long-term tenancies because of the laws. Landowners are terrified to hand out you know, anything nowadays. So what can we do to sort of redefine what that is? Could we even change it to a new entrant as somebody that's in business for less than five years? Because we know farming's a lot about reputation and how well you can do your job. And landowners won't rent out to somebody they don't know or don't trust. Because it's quite a personal thing I've found with land. They get very emotionally involved with it and they want to know and trust who's farming it for them. Yeah, and I'm certainly open to all of that. And that's why I was saying that we'd undertaken that evaluation of the previous schemes to find out what work and what what works and what doesn't. And that's where it's also really important for me to hear that feedback from you about why you weren't able to access it. So that's certainly will be considered in all these factors when we're looking to, to shape new entrance support in the future. Because yeah, we want to make sure that it's it's accessible to people that we're reaching the people that we need to reach with that as well. And we're providing the right kind of support. So, um, yeah, thank you for making that point to me. I'm certainly open to considering all that. Thanks, Amy Jo. Uh, am I right, Jane, that, that you were next up with another question? Yes, thank you, Anna. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, raising awareness about well-being and mental health in the rural sector is immensely important. SEYFC have put in a strong effort to support our membership namely through our Are You OK? campaign and through our recent farm safety training with our designated mentors, which covers mental health as a key subject. Can you tell us what other support is available and how important it is for such support to be available for those working in agriculture? It's absolutely vital. And that's where I want to thank you for the work that you've done uh, on this as well and raising awareness, because I think that's one of the things that jumped out at me during the pandemic is, um, well, I live in Brecon and just driving along the dual carriageway, there'd been, I, I think it was SAYFC who'd been involved in, I, yeah, there was loads of stuff in the fields that, you know, hit you as you were driving past and it was really visible and I think your campaign was really visible and uh, again something that I'm certainly keen to support where we can as well but I, I think it, especially now we're seeing probably the, the perfect storm of you know cost increases right across the board and I know that this is 
a really challenging time for people right across agriculture. When you look at fertilizer prices, the massive increase in input costs that people are facing. And I know that there will be a lot of people who are struggling. So that's where we're certainly trying to get out the word about the, the help and support that is there because there is help and support and really raising awareness of what there's too. So for example, there's RSABI, so the charity, and they provide emotional, practical and financial assistance to people and their families across the agricultural sector, including farming and crofting. And they're still supporting people to manage the the impact of Brexit and the pandemic, let alone all the challenges that we're facing at the moment as well. And I know that they're also currently piloting the Seasonal Agricultural Workers help Helpline, and uh, that's going to extend the scope and remit of the current helpline that they operate as well. And we really try to work with RSAPI and provide them with funding to enable some of that, that work to happen because I think it is really important that we get the word out about them, about the work that they're doing at the moment and spread that word as, as far and wide as possible. We also have a mental health strategy in government and we support the National Rural Mental Health Forum and that's really to deflect some of the, well, I suppose, really unique challenges that rural communities face, probably more so than others. And the forum really supports people in rural areas to maintain good mental health and well-being. And it also tries to develop the connections between communities across rural Scotland to reflect the, you know, as I was saying, the unique challenges that are pre uh, presented by rural isolation as well. We are also, well, I'd actually just had a, a meeting fairly recently with Farmstrong and I don't know if you're aware of that initiative or if you've been involved in that as well. And we've provided funding to them to look at some initial scoping work into the, the Farmstrong model, which has operated in New Zealand for quite a long time. And really what that model aims to do is focus on prevention. So trying to help people at an early stage so that they're not reaching crisis point and they don't need that that late intervention in respect of farmers' well-being. And I'm expecting to hear more about that either late in the spring and early summer with recommendations as to, you know, how we can further look to, to support that model once that initial piece of work uh, has happened. So, um, yeah, again, I suppose I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. If you think that there's any further work that we can be doing either in tandem with you or with other organisations to really, um, I suppose, raise awareness of the help and support that's there, but yeah, really encouraging people to to speak out and to and to seek that help as well, because I know it can be quite an isolating industry for for a lot of people, and we really want to ensure that, especially at this time when things are getting really tough, that people know help is there. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Thank you very much for that. RSABI is an amazing charity, and uh, the more we can all support them, the better. Ben, I think you had one final question. You've got about 90 seconds, if that's okay, on rural housing. Was, was that you, Ben? Yeah. Um, for a lot of us starting out in our career um, or even start, trying to start out in our own right, it's looking at contract farming agreements, share farming agreements. But often trying to get a house, um, we have to move. You have to live where you work. Um, but trying to get a house on farm just now is incredibly difficult. Firstly, planning. We're, we're not allowed to build houses on farm. And second of all, actually, rural housing, the cost of rural housing, it's great for people that can come out of the city and buy a lovely house. But for folk that actually live and work in rural Scotland, it's pricing us out of the market. We can't afford to buy. And finally, the third point on housing is actually the standard of, of um, tied accommodation that goes with, with agricultural work. There's no set standard that that needs to be. Um, on a private let, it has to be a certain standard before somebody can live in it. In agriculture, you can be given whatever you like and you're expected to live there. And um, I think we should be looking to, to actually look after our workforce far better. Uh, yeah, I agree with you and you're absolutely right. And yeah, just taking that last point first, that's where we've committed. We'll have a plan, housing to 2040. That commits us to bringing that housing stock into the same condition as the rest of Scottish housing stock, essentially to provide social justice and equality for exactly the reasons that you've talked about. I think just because you're living and working in a rural area, you shouldn't be expected to live in a you know a poorer standard. I think everybody should have the same rights in terms of what to expect for their housing. There are particular issues and challenges, though, uh, I think in relation to some of the, the, the housing stock and the work to get us there. But that's definitely a firm commitment that we have in relation to that. So I just want to provide you with an assurance on that front. 
in relation to affordability, yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's a massive issue right across rural Scotland at the moment and our island communities too, where it's, we want to make sure that we have, that we're supporting fragile communities and we want to encourage repopulation of areas as well as supporting, you know, that population where it's fragile. But we always come up against the same issues, you know, whether that's connectivity, whether it's access to, to housing as well is a really critical one. So we are trying to address that as well. We have uh, the, a Rural and Islands Housing Action Plan, which is going to be developed, which we hope will uh, enable the the provision of more affordable housing in uh, in the most r remote and rural parts of Scotland and our, our island communities too. And in relation to planning, I mean, this is another thing that I don't know if you're aware of and me talking earlier about all the different consultations and policies that we're looking at across government at the moment too. But we currently have, I, I think it's still out to consultation at the moment, the National Planning Framework 4 for Scotland, which really sets out our planning ambitions for the for the foreseeable future. And it's, it's really about enabling that development. So like you say, rather than planning being an inhibitor to that type of thing, how can we encourage more house building and because we're not talking huge developments, but, you know, being able to to have the flexibility to build houses on land, to enable that for your workers or the people that are coming on farm, I, I think it's really important. And that's really what this document sets out to do as well. So, again, I would cut, encourage you to have a look at that if you haven't had a chance to look at it already, because I think it's it's about how we enable that development and we plan for the future um, so that hopefully we can try and tackle some of the problems that you've raised there. Great. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, uh, thank you. That was real whistle-stop tour of a number of different issues. I suspect that we may take you up on your offer to chat to you again, hopefully in person next time. Um, but for now, I know you need to head off. So thanks to you. Thank you to all of the, the young farmers who've joined as well. I know a lot of you are in the middle of carving and lambing and you've got all sorts of things going on on the farm. So uh, coming back into the office for an hour is not always easy. But um, from me um, and the the, the on-farm podcast team, thanks to all of you. I think that's been a really good chat and hopefully it'll be the first of many. Yeah, thank you all so much. It was really nice to meet you. And yeah, look forward to meeting up with you in person the next time. Thanks great. so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. It's really great to have been able to host that chat uh, despite being far too old <laughs> to be classed as anything near a young farmer. We scratched the surface of a number of different important issues and I hope it's just the start of a longer and fuller dialogue. Thank you again to the Cabinet Secretary and of course to SAYFC leaders Ben, Amy Jo, John and Gillian. This episode has been a partnership with the Scottish Rural Network so thank you also to them. Our usual reminder again that On Farm is made for you by our team at Seen and Heard PR and Marketing. So just find us anytime you want to talk about any aspect of rural and foodie PR and communications. We would love to hear from you. Um, a final mention, if you don't mind, um, for the Be Your Best Self programme, which is a short programme being run at the moment, funded by the Scottish Government, for women in agriculture. And it helps with leadership and all sorts of other development skills. So if you Google Be Your Best Self Scottish Government, you'll be able to find a link uh, to find out more and to apply. There's a cohort in May that has a couple of spaces left. So get in quick um, because it's a really, really valuable course. Right, that is more than enough of my voice today. I shall uh, leave you until next week and have a good week. Bye.